Please welcome Lori Kilmartin, everybody. Oh, thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. Right on. Thank you for coming out tonight, you guys. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> it's a show called 45 Jokes About My Dead Dad. And uh, you guys thought that would be a reasonable way <laughs> to spend a Saturday night. <laughs> and uh, this, I guess, bodes well for my uh, upcoming musical about Ebola. <laughs> um, <really. It's> very <laughs> I think we'll have some good attendance. So, uh. um, so I if you don't know uh, what's going on, or this, this is, a, is just comedy about my dad. My dad died in March. He had lung cancer for nine months before that, and then he was in hospice for 10 days. And, uh, you know, it's something that inherently funny just drops in your lap. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I, I know it's a sensitive topic, and I just want you guys to know I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty experienced. I've been a comedian for uh, 27 years. <laughs> yes, I've been in stand up comedy for 27 years. I, I am an Emmy nominated writer for The Conan Show. Yes, Emmy nominated, that's correct. So I, uh, I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> Not my dad, he's dead. <laughs> that's the first joke, guys. Uh, 44 more to go. was telling unconscious dad, I love you. Then hospice said he could be like that for six weeks. Started telling dad, shit or get off the pot. Look dude at the Verizon store. Don't ask how I'm doing today if you aren't prepared to hear. Good for someone who just buried her dad on Monday. I honestly wasn't trying to live tweet my dad's death, like that's how it ended up being portrayed, and I guess that's what it was, but normally when I'm, when I'm home in the Bay Area, uh, I try to do sets every night, and I couldn't leave. I wasn't gonna leave my dad, so I just started, you know, I was writing jokes down, and instead of doing them that night at a, you know, an open mic or something, I just uh, tweeted them instead. If you're a comic and you're in line at Starbucks and your shit's taking too long, you. you your life tweeting your annoyance, I guess, and this is more uh, an observation of this unmanageable thing that's happening, and I'm, I'm just trying to condense it down into jokes, you know. On the bright side, for Christmas, I gave my dad the latest iPad. Today, I got it back, and it's still the latest iPad. I guess it's therapeutic to make jokes about painful things. To me, it's just a comforting way to create something precise out of something that's wild and huge and terrifying, you know? We've always had a really good sense of humor and have been able to tease each other and other family members fairly mercilessly. He was the dad, you know, if he ever actually did get mad, it was like a once in a decade big deal. Mom got mad all the time. When she and her sister get together, I, of course, am the brunt of their humor. Um, they're very, very amusing. Just every once in a while, you know, they go a little too far. <laughs> My mom told me he was in the hospital. If I remember, some like clot, if they'd waited a few hours longer, that would have killed him instantly or something. Getting a call, you know, dad's gone into the hospital and then talking with the docs and kind of you know, really rooting for lymphoma because I knew that that could have a good outcome. He had some luck with his first couple rounds of chemo and he was under the impression that he was cured. And I remember reading through the report and going, it, it still said there's a couple tumors here. I just wanted to remember everything. I wanted to remember every second. So. I guess I felt like a lot of the tweets were almost like little notes to myself. He's slipping away so quickly, and I just want to keep every moment preserved in Amber, I guess, and or on Twitter. <laughs> I didn't think I was doing anything exploitive, you know? I, I felt like what I was tweeting was a common experience 
I, I was just sort of tweeting to my, you know, I think I had like 7,000 followers at the time, and probably most of them were other comedians. When Lori's dad was sick, Lori was on Twitter as if she was writing a memoir about it. It's almost like you're seeing in real time a documentary. It was very moving, and I felt really connected to what she was going through. It's how I n checked in with her every day. I have like 30 Twitter followers, and I was Twittering it out to all of them. Then a couple of people started retweeting it, and then it, there, it started to snowball of like, whoa, this is a live thing, this is happening. A, a lot of people who had already been through that or you know, were gonna go through that or were, were going through it. And then Patton Oswalt retweeted one. Something like, holy shit, Lori Kilmartin is re you know, live tweeting her father and he's dying. It was a way to be very defiant with her own kind of despair and sadness to just fire jokes at it where she could really be uh, real and very honest and very uncomfortable. Um, like three weeks before he died, we went to, uh, <clears throat> he had a hard time getting out of the car and stuff. And I was like, fuck, you know, and then the doctor said, we'll do another round of chemo. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's reduce those tumors again. He went back for that round of chemo and um, the doctor said it would be useless uh, and that, that he was gonna go into hospice. And hospice for us meant he was gonna be coming back to the house, going home. He thought he was gonna, he thought he'd beat it. And then he, he realized he had it, you know. I just kept thinking it, it can't be happening yet, not my dad. Like everyone else, I was just watching the situation unfold as she was, you know, posting about it. She is being brutally honest about what's happening to her father. And you knew where this was going, and everyone knew where this was going. She was telling us what she was going through, and she has a comic mind. And I thought it was really beautiful. You know, all of a sudden you're in hospice with your dad and you've never heard of these things before and no one's told you how shocking it is to see somebody waste away. The whole thing surprised me so much because um, it was so fast. Let me tell you that I was not reading any jokes. That was too much for me to handle at that time. <laughs> Aww. We didn't really have much help. You know, they brought my dad home, and there were a couple people that showed us how to work different machines that we would need, and uh, they said he could be like this for six weeks. So then they left, and we're, my sister and I were like, what the fuck? Yeah, I couldn't imagine leaving my dad like that, you know? In the way in which Facebook and Twitter in the past 10 years have become a natural and normal part of our life, it was a natural and normal part of his death. I see my face scrolling through George Takei's Facebook feed and I'm like, what is going on? That was bizarre. There was something that felt like, I don't know, it was being honored, even if it's like, click, like, or so sorry. There were people all over the world who were saying, you know, hang in there, Ron. You know, we're rooting for you. That was just, that was incredibly comforting in that time. You must have done something right to be so adored. <laughs> And not just us now, the whole world, Dad. There are literally hundreds of thousands of people who know you, who know your name, who know what you're going through right now. They're and praying, they're praying for, you. for you. And they're praying for Mom, too. Yeah. That she stops talking. I... <laughs> 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 My dad was a guy, I think he may have had ADD or something. He just always had to have stuff going and he would make eye contact but it would be very fast and then he'd be onto something else. One thing I, I loved about hospice was he wasn't busy and he didn't have another thing to do. He was very still. He would just look at me and just stay looking at me. 
I don't know what he was thinking, but I was thinking how much I love, I, I was thinking I love you. And I think he was thinking that too. He uh, fell asleep and I, and I was like, phew, <laughs> that was a rough night. Um, but that was his last night. He wanted um, a 21 gun salute. I was carrying the uh, flag, which you're supposed to carry a certain way, and I had it like under my arm, like a like a purse. <laughs> One of the guys comes over and <laughs> corrects me. It was that was pretty humiliating. There's seven guys with rifles, and they each shoot them three times, and it was really cool. You know, I wish I wish my dad could have seen it. You'd find yourself laughing at some of the things that she would say, but then you'd think, oh my God, that is dark. I can't believe I'm laughing. But that is the essence of, of really good comedy. That night, is after the funeral, uh, Norm MacDonald, who I'd met like once, um, Norm tweeted something to me that whatever this is, it's just love. I don't know, I mean, I feel like now too, but I felt like I broke open. I just like screamed and I howled for a really long time. Until my dad died, I really had not experienced tragedy in my own life. In, in a flip way, I realized, oh, this is what people do. This is how they process death, and it's an important thing. It kind of takes, takes the sting out of death in a way. I notice when I talk about my dad, I don't know if I mentioned that he's dead. <laughs> ever felt as driven to talk about a certain thing on stage as I had about my dad. When big things like this drop, it's like, whoa, it's just a huge carcass for me to feed on. <laughs> Sorry for that metaphor. It was like a huge puzzle I had to solve on stage that I felt um, very driven to do that. I went to every fucking gig I could get and just started working out cancer jokes. And um, I lost a lot of money on it. My mom died in hospice, and I didn't think it would be like Oh, okay. Oh. Very sorry about that. Well, this is incredibly awkward. <laughs> I was just talking about my dad on stage. I was doing jokes about him having cancer. Then you start talking about death, and the audience clams up. A few people are into it, and everyone else is like, no, fuck, stop it. Sometimes you just have to let yourself go. That's why comics will say things and sometimes go, okay, that went too far. Lori was able to do with this terrible tragedy, be incredibly sad and incredibly hilarious at the same time. I mean, I was really crying at home reading it. I know that humor is a positive coping mechanism, and sometimes I think people hang on to the bad feelings too long, and it wrecks their life. And the best thing you can do is find a way to laugh about it. I had a uh, not a similar situation, but I went through something, you know, kind of horrific this year, and, and I, I wasn't prompted to run to Twitter and write about it. It's not a conscious decision to cross a line. It, it, it just comes from whatever you think is funny and whatever you're just compelled to talk about. I told my mom and my sister the name of the show. My sister was fine with it. My mom just sort of is like, okay, girls. You know, she doesn't really pay that much attention. It was sad and heavy and heart-wrenching, but it was also hilarious at times. It was really helpful to a lot of people. It sounded like it, a lot of the comments. My husband really, really loved Lori's sense of humor. First I was surprised, and then I realized it was, it was helping her and him. So. That's my Lori. <laughs>"Grandpa, hey, pretend I'm not videotaping, get please. Over, get over, get over there. Get, get over, over there. there. You're get ruining over, it. Get over. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
there is a tradition of comedians tackling dark subjects from their life. She's really brave and ballsy and she goes for it. And I have so much respect for her as a writer and as a performer. Haven't cried in over five hours. Seems like I'm pretty much over it. I want jokes to work. You know, even when, when they're about death, I want them to work. I wish people talked about it more. I don't care how you do it. If you joke about it or talk about it seriously or, you know, make some great documentary, I don't care about it. Like, talk about it. Death's spirit lives on in the dozens and dozens of loose AA batteries that still might be good. We're all gonna be part of it one day. You're gonna bury your parents, and it might be like this. And it's fucking awful, <laughs> you know? So here's some jokes. And if I lose you as a follower after this journey has ended, it was great knowing you, XOXO. Knock, knock. <laughs> Not my dad, he's dead. <laughs> That's the first joke, guys. Uh, 44 more to go. And then, then we're all going to get the massage of a lifetime. I organized a group on for everybody here. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty awesome. Now, um, I, I, my dad died in in March, so I, I feel like of the Kubler Ross uh, five stages, I've been through three: uh, denial, anger, Twitter. <laughs> uh, this might be four, the stand-up special, <laughs> and then five is finding distribution. <laughs> that's a, it's an LA audience. You know exactly. <laughs> what the stages of death and dying are. <laughs> um, I, I had a, amazing support. Like, you do not have to feel bad for me. Uh, my family, everyone's been amazing. My, my boyfriend, oh my gosh, in bed, he stopped asking, who's your daddy? <laughs> and he started asking, who's the father figure <laughs> you, would, <laughs> you would like me to pretend to be from behind? Just... So sensitive and so sweet. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very lucky. And I'm, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Is, uh, has anyone else, I'm sure some other people have lost a parent, correct? Yeah. Wow. It's, <laughs> it's nice to know the recovery that's available. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> By the way, this is, uh, in all my years of comedy, this is the most uncomfortable crowd work I've ever participated <laughs> in. <laughs> It's a lot, usually, like, uh, who's Armenian? <laughs> I, I guess Glendale's empty, ta -da, you know. It's so much more preferable than who's got a dead parent. <laughs> so um, it, is, it is tough to lose a parent. Uh, it's even tougher if you were hoping to lose the other parent first. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> my mom is a pistol. <laughs> and that that's what you want to put in your mouth when she talks to you. <laughs> okay. Loaded pistol. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not the only one who uh, feels that way. My dad's last words to me were, ha ha, she's your problem now. <laughs> and then he ascended to heaven like a conquistador. <laughs> that reminds me, guys, if, if there's any... Um, uh, if, it, if there's any joke here tonight that's too rough, uh, I, I want you to know uh, that you have my, uh, my feminist permission to stare at my boobs <laughs> until you feel better. Uh, they're pretty big, people seem to enjoy them. I don't even, I do a disservice by calling them boobs. This is a bosom. <laughs> it's a, this is matriarchal, this is comforting, so. If there's any time where you like cringe a little, you just mentally put your head right between lefty and righty and <laughs> let them go. <laughs> They're very comforting. My, my dad, I, I take comfort in the fact that he died doing what he did best, growing tumors. <laughs> it was a skill he learned late in life, guys, but boy. <laughs> He turned into a world-class master. It was pretty, pretty amazing, you know? Even the last week of his life, he was like, more! <laughs> I was like, Dad, relax, calm down, Dad! <laughs> his work ethic is just so inspiring to me. That's, uh, 
<laughs> my friend goes, oh, I get it. It's like you're roasting your dad. And I was like, yeah, poor choice of words. <laughs> he was cremated. Um, I, uh, my mom and my sister and I each have a bit of his ashes, and I was keeping his ashes in a vase on the mantle, and then we had an earthquake, and the mantle shook and the vase fell. So now I keep his ashes in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Don't, it's not disrespectful. I, I went out and got a special vacuum cleaner. I'm like, stay there. <laughs> Don't move, Dad. I'm getting you a Dyson right now. This, this Kirby is not worthy of you. <laughs> I'm getting cyclone technology. <laughs> no, I actually have some right here. I, I have this little ring. It's a clatter ring. And it, in the heart, you can put ashes. So I keep them here. It, it, this helps me keep close to my dad, having the ashes right here. I like it. It also helps me get out of a lot of hand jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Guys are like, what's that? I'm like, that's my dad. <laughs> Where did it go? What am I squeezing? Now, <laughs> admittedly, it could be my hand job technique is also getting me out of some of the hand jobs. The old squeeze and release. <laughs> it's what I'm known for, but uh, I'll stop that one right now. <laughs> that joke stops abruptly. <laughs> Two minutes. <clears throat> um, it's so strange that you can keep ashes and no one thinks it's weird. I mean, that is a physical piece of your loved one, is their ashes. You know, you can wear them, you can keep them, it's totally acceptable. But bones. <laughs> Not acceptable. <laughs> I don't know why. It seems like it would be the coolest thing in the world to have your loved one's bones. <laughs> I'd love to wear bones. Why do we let murderers have all the fun? <laughs> I'd love to wear a neck around my neck. A neck necklace. How meta is that? <laughs> People would be like, that is so pretty. And you could be like, thank you. It belonged to my grandmother. <laughs> My dad, uh, two weeks before my dad died, he went shopping at Costco. He had an oxygen mask on and he bought 10 boxes of long lasting light bulbs <laughs> at Costco. Uh, I don't blame my dad, I blame Costco. <laughs> they should have called me when he got to the register and said, your dad is here, he has two weeks to live and 180 years of light <laughs> in his cart. <laughs> I don't know why we let old people even buy in bulk whatsoever. <laughs> as soon as an old person walks into Costco, they should be walked to a Walgreens. <laughs> you, you can have one light bulb, and if you're still alive when it blows out, you can get another one. And when they're on oxygen, they should go right to the travel size section of Walgreens. Because <laughs> clearly they're about to go on a journey. <laughs> Pick up some tiny shampoos. <laughs> um, my dad turned 83 when he was dying. That was, a, that was a very strange birthday. We knew it was his last birthday. Uh, and it was odd, it was like, uh, I didn't know what to get my dad. Do I get him something he wants? or something I want <laughs> to inherit in what would seem to be weeks. <laughs> um, I got him an iPad. <laughs> That's what every old person wants, is to learn new technology <laughs> when they're dying. That's uh, in my defense, if I hadn't got my dad an iPad, all he would have inherited was 10 boxes of long-lasting <laughs> light bulbs. <laughs> Pretty happy with my decision. Um, my dad would, uh, would love that this is happening. He loved the fact that I was a comic, so he would go on the road with me. He would sit in the back, 
watch the show. So I, I feel like his spirit is here tonight, and uh, some of you are sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> Please be. Please be gentle. We had a, we, I lo- we had a very great relationship, even though we were on opposing sides on every single argument. This is a perfect example of me and my dad. He was a devout Catholic, so every Saturday night he would write out a check to the Catholic Church and leave it on the table, and then go to bed, and he planned to take it to Mass the next morning. And after you go to sleep, I would take the check, and on the memo, I would write pedophile defense fund. <laughs> It never got old. <laughs> and it never got inaccurate. <laughs> uh, no, my, my dad, we were, we were uh, wildly apart politically. My dad was in the Tea Party, and uh, I'm a liberal. So we would always uh, have these uh, great arguments about everything. And uh, now, as a daughter, I'm, I'm very conflicted. Like, as a daughter, I'm, I'm devastated that my dad is gone. But as a liberal, (laughs) (laughs) that's one less member of the Tea Party. (laughs) And don't tell, don't be like, "Oh, that joke is mean," because I'm, I, I, I'm telling you, in a parallel universe, if Ann Coulter had a liberal father, she would make that exact same joke. Uh, that's a moot point, of course, because uh, if Ann Coulter had had a liberal father, he would have killed himself decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> no one is that strong. <laughs> I learned that the phrase, I'm sorry for your loss, is perfect. It is the perfect condolence. You don't need to add anything to it. People would always go, were you guys close? You know, and uh, just so you know, I only, I only would write jokes about somebody I was very close to. You know, except for Ann Coulter. (laughs) I only made a joke about her because I look like her if she were a woman. (laughs) And just to cover my ass, that was not, uh, that Ann Coulter joke was not an anti-trans joke, okay? It was an anti-Ann joke. (laughs) Um... (laughs) <laughs> I need, actually need my own boobs as comfort at times, guys. <laughs> Dad, I miss you. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank God I have them to comfort me. <laughs> the cold nights. It's hard. People c- don't know when to shut up, you know? Like, this is a perfect example. Well, it's not perfect. It's very inappropriate. <laughs> But I was having sex with my boyfriend, and in the middle of it, he goes, your pussy is so tight. And I was like, yay. (laughs) (laughs) No one ever tells me that. Like, (laughs) I've had a baby, you know? And tight is the only adjective any woman ever wants to hear, ever. So I was like, you're perfect. And then he kept talking. (laughs) He's like, it's interesting, it interests me. It ruined it. (laughs) So my overall point is, in condolences and in sex, (laughs) know when to shut up. Uh, Your pussy is tight. I'm sorry for your loss. So my dad had a stage four cancer, and um, that's when, when we discovered it, he had stage four. And that is hard to survive. The only person I can think of that survived stage four cancer was Lance Armstrong. He had testicular stage four cancer, and he completely, he completely survived it. And uh, Lance Armstrong is an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I think it must help to be an asshole to survive stage four cancer, right? I think his cancer was like, this guy's a dick. <laughs> He's lying to everybody. I don't want to be in his balls. I wish we could figure out a way to slow down cancer. You could just live with it, you know? Like uh, HIV, people live with HIV now. You know, they get a cocktail, right? (laughs) It sounds fun, man. (laughs) You know, we slowed down Charlie Sheen. (laughs) Remember? 
remember? Remember a couple years ago, we thought he was gonna die? We're like, oh my God, he's got stage four Charlie Sheen. <laughs> right, and then like we were tweeting about it and joking about it and he heard and he paid attention. He's like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. He, he left CBS, he went to a safe place, FX. <laughs> <laughs> He's not in like remission. I think he just groped a dentist. So, <laughs> you know, that's like stage two Charlie Sheen, though, right? That's practically Emilio Estevez. <laughs> <laughs> so my sister and I, you know, we both, you know, we were we were hoping my dad would beat cancer, like we had always hoped he would beat my mom. <laughs> You know what's cool about being a comedian is if my mom ever hears this stuff, she's gonna think I'm joking. <laughs> I don't know why I'm even talking about her right now. It's back to my dad, right? I, although if she dies, I'm not telling 45 jokes about her. I will throw a party that's 45 days long. And you're all invited. <laughs> so my dad, so his, his uh, cancer comes back. He, he you know, had some successful chemo, and then it came back uh, or, or right around the nine-month mark. And um, oncologists, those cancer doctors are oncologists, and they're, they use the most benign language to describe the most malignant shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, the cancer come back, and you could see tumors in my dad's back, like, sticking out, and my dad's sitting over there, and the oncologist is like, well, the chemo is not uh, providing the results that we'd hoped for. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> yeah, my dad looks like a sack of apples. Yeah, that's <laughs> not the results we'd hope for, doctor. <laughs> so um, this is, it was time for my dad to go into hospice. And uh, hospice, there's two kinds of hospice. You can send somebody to a, a hospice space, which is nice with uh, walls that have been painted in the last 50 years, <laughs> uh, furniture that matches. Or you can bring them home <laughs> where they die surrounded by shit they always meant to give to Goodwill. <laughs> that's, that's the option we took. Uh, my dad spent most of his ho uh, hospice on a couch from Ikea. Uh, little, uh, here's a little fact. It's the first uh, piece of furniture in Ikea history to outlast its owner. <laughs> <laughs> usually falls apart before you do, <laughs> but <laughs> not in this case. So the hospice nurse comes, and uh, the, you know, hospice is just a completely surreal situation. So she brings six vials of morphine, and she goes, uh, well, you know what? You give this to your dad, make sure he's comfortable, and then if there's any left, you <laughs> just give us a call, and we'll come get it. <laughs> I was like, wow, very... Very laid back. Uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize an opiate could be on the honor system. <laughs> Already? <laughs> and then you sign a contract. They put a contract in front of you where basically when your loved one starts to die, you can't help them, you know? So I was like, oh, it's like being a doctor at Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they did not find it amusing. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you sign this contract and you say, like you check off, you're not gonna call a doctor, you're not gonna call an ambulance, you won't call 911. Uh, if your car starts to die in this process, you can't even call AAA. <laughs> which, you know, makes sense, AAA would be tempting. My dad, my dad needs a jump. <laughs> and uh, if it doesn't work, he's gonna need a tow. this stuff I'm initialing and signing it and I'm thinking how am I going to do this this is insane I, I, I really don't know how I'm going to make it through this process and then my eyes wander over to the six vials of morphine <laughs> and I, I'm like oh <laughs> I understand <laughs> I think morphine's unofficial motto is the sick person gets the most <laughs> <laughs> And the family gets the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, my sister and I were taking care of my dad. We were washing him and taking him to the bathroom and stuff. And we realized very early on there was a very high probability we might accidentally see our dad's junk. <laughs> and we're like, holy shit, that can't happen. <laughs> like we, had, we had a family meeting immediately. <laughs> You know, like, I don't want to see his junk. I've never seen it. I don't want to start now. Like, first of all, it's probably not at its best. <laughs> if you're going to accidentally see your dad's junk, it should be when he's in his 30s and really giving it to your mom. Just <laughs> <laughs> That's how dads would want to be remembered, right? No one wants their 83-year-old junk seen by anybody. I don't my junk scene by anybody now. You, you heard my boyfriend, it's interesting. <laughs> and yes, I know he said tight too, but he's African American, so everybody's tight to him. <laughs> I'll believe it's tight when a white guy says it. <laughs> so my sister and I, we, we made like what we, we called the Oedipus Pledge where <laughs> if one of us saw dad's junk, the other would gouge her eyes out <laughs> immediately. And we left spoons all over the house. <laughs> there would not be a moment of sight if it happened. <laughs> and so, you know, and every time I would clean my dad and I got in anywhere near the area, I would blow into a rape whistle <laughs> and my sister would come with blankets and... Uh, we managed to not see it. It was, pretty, it was a great victory. We, we sort of high-fived each other when we realized we did his whole hospice without seeing it. And I, I like to think that he was in heaven high-fiving, like, you know, Korean War vets. You know, they never saw my 10 inches of terror. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate. Uh, I'm assuming that my dad was well-endowed because my son appears to be well-endowed, and that's hereditary. And it's uh, got to have come from my father because it certainly didn't come from his. <laughs> you know, uh, some people have told me that joke is unnecessary. <laughs> but, uh, you know what? I, I think the world's first grandfather, grandson dick joke is completely necessary. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Guys, I'm grieving. <laughs> we had a ton of visitors during hospice. And this, this is just something I noticed. Five people asked my dad to say hello to their dead dog. After the show, right here, right here, <laughs> right here, after the show. We'll just, there'll be a line <laughs> right by the potato chips, guys, right here. <laughs> Five people wanted my dad to say hello. He had a list of dogs, like Rex, Buddy, Charlie. He actually made a list. <laughs> he was very willing to do it. But zero people asked my dad to say hello to their dead cat. <laughs> That tells me that dog people believe their dogs are waiting for them, and cat people know their cats don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, your dead cat moved in with a dead family, <laughs> and you are alive to him. <laughs> My friend Brandy goes, uh, oh, you have to record your dad singing happy birthday to you. So I, I did that, and I played that on my birthday, and that was awesome. That was a, such a great idea. I also recorded him saying, I'm so proud of you, Lori. <laughs> I play that like after a good show or after I turn my boyfriend down for anal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so proud of you, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a couple days like that that were fun and then uh, well <laughs> relatively fun <laughs> but we just talked and stuff and then day eight he, he died on day 10 so day eight seemed like it was going to be the day he was dying like he he seemed unconscious to me and uh, so I was trying to figure out ways to to wake him up you know and, and I, I turned on Fox News <laughs> I, I sat next to my dad and I'm like 
am like, maybe a screaming Sean Hannity <laughs> will bring my dad back. You know? if, if anything will, it will be Sean. And uh, so we sat and watched for like 15 minutes, and my dad did not stir. Uh, I felt myself getting cancer. <laughs> so, so I started channel surfing, and uh, I, I found the sweet spot, which was the History Channel. I don't know if you know about old men in the History Channel, but they fucking love World War II documentaries. So I put on World War II, the whole war. We <laughs> We watched the whole goddamn war. <laughs> and my dad started to stir and he sat up and he started drinking water. It was like this crazy parallel trajectory as Hitler rose to power. <laughs> so did my dad. <laughs> and then we ended up having a great night of like two hours of talking and memories. Like I still cherish day eight of hospice. I remember that so much. And it, it's, it's left me with very conflicted feelings towards Adolf Hitler. <laughs> I know he's a bad guy, but he's got a special place in my heart. <laughs> and then day nine, again, day nine, it looked like the last day, and that's when I decided to extort my dad. I, I, sa I saved my boyfriend for what I thought would be his last day. My boyfriend, they, he, they had not met before, and as I said, my boyfriend's African-American. Mm -hmm. So they met, they, had a, they talked about geology. My boyfriend was a geologist, so they talked about rocks and nerded out about that. And then uh, he left and I go, Dad, you can't die today or people will think that you're racist. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, you go 83 years without dying and then the one day you meet my black boyfriend. <laughs> Does not look good, dude. <laughs> and he hung on another day. <laughs> and then he died the next morning. And I, I was there when he died. Uh, I missed his last breath because I was on my iPhone. I know. <laughs> but it was a good tweet, guys. Uh, I think I got about 13 new followers, so. No, you know what? You actually are never gonna know it's someone's last breath until they don't take the next one. <laughs> You know, so you're not gonna notice it unless you're a creepy person who <laughs> stares at people when they breathe. <laughs> but that, by the way, that's the look my mom gives when she's being tender. <laughs> <laughs> if that explains any of my jokes. <laughs> she means well, but it just doesn't come out right. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, it would be nice if uh, dying people would give you a heads up <laughs> that they're about to take their last breath, right? Hey everybody, gather round. <laughs> I think this is it, this is gonna be my last inhale. <laughs> I have one request, nobody fart. <laughs> Please, it's my last breath. I, Know how you people digest complex carbohydrates. <laughs> and I, I don't want it to smell like your dinner at Taco Bell. <laughs> we kept my dad, my dad died on a Sunday morning and we kept him till Monday morning. We could have called hospice and the mortuary immediately to get them to take the body, but you know, we had some morphine to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm kidding. I did not. I did not partake. I, I may have gotten a few drops on my tongue uh, uh, when I threw my head back, opened my mouth, and poured a bottle. <laughs> in it. But <laughs> I only. I only did that every day. Um, <laughs> so uh, so we decided to keep my dad because he died on a Sunday morning, and the Oscars were that night. And my dad had never watched the entire Oscars ceremony. So, so we said, this is our last opportunity to make my dad watch the whole Oscars. And we, we sat and watched the Oscars with my dad. It was like weekend at Lori's. <laughs> he enjoyed the Oscars as much in death as he had in life. <laughs> 
And then uh, the next day they came for him. And um, that turned out to be sort of a, a good idea. Uh, we didn't do this on purpose, but you know, right after he died, he still looked like my dad. And, uh, and so it would have been really hard to see him go right then. But the next day, his body had changed, and he didn't look like my dad anymore. He looked like a corpse. <laughs> so when he left, it was like saying goodbye to Larry King. <laughs> He's a very nice person, and <laughs> he doesn't deserve that joke. <laughs> but I might leave it in. This isn't called 44 jokes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be ruthless. You guys. So his funeral, his funeral ended up being on a Monday. He was supposed to have a Saturday funeral, and he got bumped to Monday. Somebody in the, there, a famous lady in the Bay Area died, and the priest was like, we can't do both of these funerals on a Saturday, and this lady's going to have a lot more uh, mourners. And I was like, that's bullshit. It should be first die, first serve. <laughs> My dad died first. <laughs> and I felt like he kind of, he was kind of leaning to like, all right, but I was filling out paperwork and he saw my handwriting, and he's like, oh, if it isn't Miss Pedophile Defense Fund. <laughs> hmm. uh, you're, you're lucky we're not burying your dad on Wednesday. <laughs> so we, we had to do the Monday funeral. And I don't know if you know this, uh, funerals are like stand-up comedy. It's impossible to get people to come to the Monday show. <laughs> I, I had to stand outside the church and bark mourners in. <laughs> I was like, free funeral. Uh, the eulogizer has been on Conan. <laughs> Come on <in>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you pretend you're Catholic, there's one free drink. <laughs> we, uh, we packed the house. Um, you know what's strange at funerals, too, is people will show up you've never heard of, you don't know. Uh, we had people I'd never seen in my entire life. There, this, this was a, this is sort of interesting. Uh, an old Japanese guy came, and he was as bereft as my mother. I've never, no one else was as upset as a Japanese guy. And he just, he walks up to me, and he goes, your father always say howdy to me. And it was really sweet, and I didn't want to tell him he said howdy to everybody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it was sweet, and I went to go get my sister, and then I turned around, and the Japanese guy was gone. I was like, whoa, was this guy an angel? <laughs> or was he an emissary sent by the History Channel? <laughs> <laughs> represent the Axis powers? You know? <laughs> A final tribute to their greatest viewer. <laughs> <laughs> goodbye ratings, goodbye Ron Kilmartin. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. My son, uh, I have a seven-year-old son, and seven-year-old boys are sociopaths. <laughs> they, uh, they only want what they want. So after the funeral, there's no, there's no uh, register that anything sad has happened <laughs> to my son. He's playing Minecraft on my phone. And I got a call, I took the phone, and I, and I took the call, and I, uh, you know, cried a little bit and hung up the phone, and, and my son goes, why are you sad, Mom? And I go, well, uh, we're at your grandpa's funeral. Uh, <laughs> look around, the Japanese guy seems to know why we're sad, and I don't know who the fuck he is. <laughs> right? And then he goes, yeah, but why are you crying? <laughs> and I almost go, asshole, I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> then he like weasels his hand on my iPhone and he goes, are you sad because I'm not playing Minecraft? <laughs> no, I'm sad because you're a fucking serial killer. That's why I'm sad. I'm Ted Bundy's mother. Oh my God. <laughs> spend the rest of my life testifying at your parole boards <laughs> and I'm going to make him keep you. <laughs> and I got him back, of course. 
because uh, we kept talking. My dad had lung cancer, so he goes, how did Grandpa get lung cancer? And I go, well, he quit a long time ago, but for many, many years, Grandpa played Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> There's one sociopath in this family. <laughs> Time to remember that. So we went to go, uh, uh, to went to the cemetery to put his remains into, uh, you know, the niche, and we had the ceremony. My dad was a Korean War vet, so we had a military funeral, which was pretty fucking cool. Uh, we had a 21-gun salute, which is uh, three men, three servicemen in uniforms, and guns. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, men in uniform, I was quite aroused. <laughs> uh, it's, very, it's very disconcerting to have sexual feelings at your father's funeral. <laughs> Let me put it this way, at your father's funeral, only your eyes should be wet. <laughs> So each of the three had a rifle, and they shot it seven times each, 21. And uh, while they were shooting, I was so tempted to just push my mom in front of them. <laughs> Let's, do it. Let's do it. We're at a cemetery. How convenient is this? Let's, Let's turn this gun salute into a firing squad. Let's go. Oh! I'll tip you. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> The, the best part was, uh, was taps on a bugle is, uh, is really amazing. The sound, it's 24 notes, it, it's heart-rending, and um, I think the buglers know that they're about to wreck the room. Because <laughs> 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 our bugler kind of walked out all cocky. You know, like, uh, it's 1985 and he's David Lee Roth. <laughs> and he's gonna have his pick after the show. Right, <laughs> and uh, he locks eyes with me, and he and he he looks at me like, "Oh, you're going down, bitch. <laughs> you and that well-endowed little psychopath of yours." <laughs> and then he starts bugling at me. <laughs> du, du, du. <laughs> Sounded way better than that. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> du, du, du. And we're just like six notes in. I'm crying. My son is crying, and this is the first time he's cried because of an emotion, and not because I turned off the TV. So he's like, ah, he doesn't know what's happening to his body. It's <laughs> and then the bugler finishes the song, you know, and uh, when he's done, my family, which had been chatting and joking before, is just leveled. Everyone's weeping. You know, the bugler looks at us. He's happy, right? <laughs> Drops the bugle. <laughs> Walks off stage. I'm pretty sure my cousin gave him a blowjob. <laughs> <So. laughs> my boyfriend was there, or I would have given him the old <laughs> squeeze and release. The dad's ash, squeeze and release. <laughs> and then I went home. I, that, that sort of uncorked me, you know, feelings-wise. And I went home, and I went in my dad's office, and I just, uh, I wailed. I, yeah, I did that wail to the universe where I was like, I want my dad. I just shouted it over and over again for like, I don't know, it felt like an hour or two. You ever cry so hard and so thoroughly that when you finish, you like jazz? <laughs> that shit is deep. <laughs> so um, I guess in closing, I'll tell you, we, uh, so we had to figure out what to put on the, on the marker on the niche. The niche is where they put cremated remains and there's a, a marker that's a rectangle and you have limited amount of space to write something, and after my dad's name, my mom was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. We only have 40 characters. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm like, relax. <laughs> Finally, 
I have not wasted all my years on Twitter for nothing. <laughs> oh my God. 40 care. it's like a little over a third of a tweet, right? I, I got this. Husband, dad, hashtag History Channel. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. You've been great. Thank you. to name the show exactly what it was gonna be so nobody could claim that they were tricked <laughs> into uh, attending, you know? And uh, um, I'm just glad it's done and it'll be out. Now I'm waiting for this one to die and <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> it's so Lori, just 45 jokes about my dead dad just sums up her comedy, her unwillingness to compromise. I wanted to use that title for years, but my father's still alive and well. So I'm suing my father. It's obvious that Lori is turning this into a cottage industry. If I was anyone in her family, I'd be very nervous. The people in her life die, she turns it into a hilarious show. Because you know how show business is, you gotta keep topping it. I mean, she could have said 45 jokes about my deceased father, but <laughs> dead dad is Lori. <laughs> I just wanted to try and figure out a way to monetize it. I just thought, she's one of my writers, I should be getting a couple hundred thousand bucks out of this. And then someone told me, no, Conan, that's wrong. Your father's dying, and this is, uh, and I was like, okay, but how about 50,000? And then people, pretty much intervened and said, Conan, you're a sick person, you need to let this go. Everything has reshifted. We were a foursome. You know, it's like being a, a, a four-legged dog, and now you're a three-legged dog, and you learn how to walk, but, you know, it looks funny, and it, it feels weird. Not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. We think about our dad all the time. Though. Why is she thinking of turning it into a, uh... What'd she turn it into? Where, where have I been? Why am I not fa familiarized with... Is this what this thing is? Do I have to read an email? Lori Kamartin is, is a joke machine gun. I mean, she has that... She's built up that discipline in both working for shows and then running for herself where she can just write a lot of jokes and she's fast and funny. We're a culture that uh, people used to die in the home, and now we've kind of farmed it out, and McDonald's comes and takes you when it's your time. That's not really what happens. I don't please McDonald's. I'm using you as an example. I think the McNugget is great, but we all know what, uh, what you're up to. <laughs> 45 jokes about my dead. Am I, am I, am I, am I, am I When I was reading comments to my dad, they were overwhelmingly, you know, supportive and, you know, God bless them and, you know, Godspeed or all that, all that kind of stuff. And it meant a lot to him to hear that.